Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebra. Today, I would like to tell you about another application of Galois theory or field of Galois theory. Maybe the main application, maybe the reason why Galois theory was invented to begin with. And it took us a while to get here and it took everyone a while to get here. But basically, I would like to explain what Galois groups have to do with solvable polynomial equations. And by solvable, I will make that precise later, but I, you basically can think about it like you can write down a nice solution in terms of roots. Uh, those things are usually called radicals, whatever. It, it basically means you can write down something nice like uh, my, my solution is two plus square root, whatever, square root of two plus square root of three, something like that. That's the root of my polynomial, very good. So those expressions are nice. We like those expressions and we want to, would like to decide um, when is this actually possible? And that turned out to be a, a question which was open for a long, long, long time in a certain type of generality. So at least for something like 500 years, probably, probably much longer. So trying to find uh, nice solutions of polynomial equations has been around for millennia. And it, it took a little bit of genius to, to solve it because a lot of people got really, a lot of really, really smart people got stuck on that problem. And you might see in this video why, because there will be some polynomial equation which is absolutely not so trivial to solve. Um, and alternative formulation in terms of Galois theory isn't all that bad. It's not completely trivial. Um, you need to go a little bit uh, beyond the trivial examples to, before you see something, but it's certainly much, much easier. In particular, I will basically prove it by running for you a, a certain magma code. So magma, magma linked in the description, which you can run online. Um, I'm kind of cheating because I, I, I used, well, I, I solved the equation before, of course, or I built the equation to be solved, whatever. Uh, we'll come back to that later. But now let's just get started and well, to be all on the same page. So kind of, kind of the main question or the main observation is that finding explicit roots is a really tough business. Um, what you see here, I will explain that in a second, is a geometric way to solve a, a cubic equation or so something with, with x to the cubed, with x cubed. Um, this is Mathematica, so Mathematica code, which I will run in, the, in a second, and of course linked in the description. Um, and this is just so much more complicated than the geometric way or well, whatever you want to call it, a uh, way to solve the quadratic equation, which people usually call completing the square, which you very likely have seen in one form or the other. I will run a video in a second, uh, a very nice video on Wikipedia, actually. I will run that in a second, and afterwards I will show you the slightly more involved solution of or attempt to solve the, the cubic equation. I'm not even going to the uh, quadratic equation, so that would be degree four, although I will show you later a degree four equation. But no, you will see why, why I don't want to do this right now. Um, so this is certainly significantly harder. And the question that was open for a long time is, so people found after really brute force uh, attempts of very, very many, many smart people. So not, not someone like me, some, someone really smart. A lot of very, very smart people tried that. And then they found the degree four equation um, or the degree three equation and shortly afterwards the degree four equation. So a solution to cubic or quadratic equations. And then it was very open for a very long time whether you can do degree five. And the problem is a little bit that those equations which are linked in the description which are not as easy as a quadratic equation. So quadratic equation would be something you want to solve. Uh, well, let's say ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. And you can write down a solution in abc, right? You know that it's a quadratic formula. Again, if you don't know it, link to the description and we will see it anyway in, during the animation I'm going to run. Um, the, the cubic and the quadratic corresponding equations are so much more complicated. I, I don't even want to think about it. It's, it's too hard for me. Um, the, the equivalent statement on the side of Galois theory is actually reasonable. It's not so hard. It's kind of fun. So kind of Galois theory is uh, this very efficient tool of studying polynomial equations without getting, getting rid of all the compli 
complications of writing down roots of roots of roots or something like that. You will see a lot of roots of roots of roots in this in this video actually. Um, anyway, I'm I'm off topic a little bit, not quite, but I'm a bit off topic because I wanted to talk about the degree five equation. So um, so okay, someone solved the degree three and degree four equation. Very good. Uh, link to the histories in the description. It was roughly 500 years ago. Anyway, doesn't really matter anymore. It, it is a long time ago. And then a lot of people tried the degree five equation and they failed. So if you throw a lot of very, very smart people on the problem and they fail, then the problem is probably very hard. Or, and this is what, what was happening here, you just need a different perspective. And the perspective was given by Galois theory, which is extremely brilliant. Um, let me just uh, say that you can show that the degree five equation is not solvable in the sense that I'm going to show you later uh, without Galois theory, but Galois theory is just a very slick way of doing it. Anyway, so let me run uh, the animation and the two animations actually. So here's the first one stolen from Wikipedia, as you can see in the background, link is in the description. So it's the completing the square, it's solving this, this equation. It's basically just solving this equation. It's not so hard. So let's let's just watch it. It's very nice. You, of course, you can watch it as just just on Wikipedia again uh, if you would like to see it again. But it's it's pretty nice. Um, and you will see in a second why it's called called completing the square. So for now, it doesn't they look like rectangles. But of course, you don't need a. So you can rescale by a. And now x x is a nice square. And that's the square you basically want to complete. Not quite. So now you see that this is the square you want to complete. So you're missing this little bit. You just add it in, subtract it again, which is a usual trick. And that's what, what well, of course, you, you know the square, which is just the square, of course. That's why you want to complete it. And you basically just solve the quadratic equation. So if you compare what you see right now to the quadratic equation, then you will see that it's basically solved. So. There you go, just some reshuffling. And yeah, so here you have rewritten the equation. And now, of course, now you can solve it. You can just take the square root of the, of the expression on the uh, right-hand side. In comparison, the degree three equation or a specific form of the degree three equation, which I won't even explain in details because it's, it, it doesn't really matter. If you want, um, it's a Mathematica demonstration, you can, you can click on it and, and see what's going on. But it already looks very complicated. So it has seven steps. And already the first slide of this step is too complicated for me to read. Um, and then you go along and you do some geometric constructions involving uh, trisecting the angle. So here's a certain angle that will be trisected in a second. Here you go. And you go on. And uh, so this point, so if, if you believe this picture and if you're now at this point, you just turn it 120 degrees, you get three different points. And those project down to the uh, solution of the cubic equation. So it's not all that bad. Just to get the numbers straight is a bit is a bit tricky. And you will see that later on for different equations as well. So um, as soon as you kind of Galois theory wants to kick in here, right? Because it then tells you that this guy has a certain orbit under a group action, and that's the easy part, right? You, so here you go, you have this point, you take the orbit and you're done. And the explicit form, you can kind of forget it under Galois theory. Anyway, I, I don't want to really explain what's going on here because I think it's, it takes us too far off. It's not super complicated. It's also not super interesting. The only thing to keep in mind is that it's just really much, much harder than just completing the square. Okay, so what can we do? Well. We want to use Galois theory. So I want to write down pictures like this one and corresponding pictures for the Galois groups. But let's first of all, stay with this one, which is certainly just the equation uh, that I want to solve here is this equation. Very simple one. I only care, let's say about what I want to, well, th this certainly has nice solutions in terms of radicals. And my theta here is always a third root of unity. And I kind of care about the other one. So third root of two. And I write down the corresponding um, field extension table, which I get by Galois theory. So Galois gives me uh, that this table looks like this because, well, 
this guy here has Galois group S3. And what you see is just the, the subgroup lattice of S3 inverted. As usually, Galois theorem the inverts S3. But anyway, so you can read off the degrees here. And I did this um, example in another video where I skewed up the degrees, which really bothers me quite a lot, but you can't change YouTube videos anymore. So um, whatever. So uh, just, a, just a, anyway, so this hopefully is correct. So these are the degrees. This is the degree two extension. This is the degree three extension and so on. And keep in mind that this or recall, or if you haven't seen it, let me mention that this notation means that the corresponding um, subgroups here in S3 are all conjugate and they're kind of the same. And those things are also conjugate in the automorphism group of this field. So they are kind of the same. You can think of them as just being one point. So one point, and you see that all the in and outgoing actions are kind of the same anyway. The point is, this is not a normal subgroup, or of course, it doesn't correspond to a normal subgroup. Um, and what you can do here is the following trick. So the Galois group of this guy is S3, as I said, uh, which is a bit too big. It kind of misses the this guy here. You would, would like to have, uh, be this Gal the Galois group of this one, you would like it to be Z mod 3. But if you do it over the right field, if you already assume that you have an adjoint three here, you, have, you already assume that you have adjoint this um, root of unity, then you see that this is actually cyclic. Um, so it's Z mod three. And that's very, very strong property because cyclic groups are kind of the easiest things you can imagine. And I would like to think of solutions to those equations as being cyclic groups in the following sense. And this is true in general which is kind of a nice fact. Um, the only thing you need to have is that your ground ring has those re relevant roots of unities as you can already see here in this example. So the Galois extension of, uh, of, of this equation is not cyclic over Q because you're missing the root of unity, but it's cyclic over, so it's cyclic over uh, this field as soon as you adjoin the root of unity. And that's exactly the point. So whenever you adjoin a pure root and the pure root would be just a solution to x to the n minus a, and a is an element of my ground field, um, then you have a cyclic Galois group. And conversely, so this is kind of an even only if, if you have a cyclic Galois group, then you can find, um, find a, a polynomial, a pure polynomial such that you get your uh, field extension is actually um, a pure extension. So it's, it's, it's a it, it consists of those pure roots of those, this equation. And that's exactly what we want. So what we want is we want to start with a polynomial, which is complicated. We then want to, well, let's say our ground field is Q. We then want to adjoin something, which is as easy as possible. So some root of some, I just write, I just write this, for example. And then we want to adjoin more and more. So in, in every step, you can then take a root of whatever you see, or an nth root of whatever you see. So what you're adjoining uh, secretly are um, something like this, uh, whatever, something like that. Because um, in the second, in the first step, you would adjoin third root of three in this case. So this is now an element of your field, whatever you see under the square root. So you can now adjoin a square root of it and takes the next step. And then you adjoin another one and takes the next step. So what you will see in a second, uh, is what, what is called a tower of field extensions, such that in each step, you, you basically increase your field by adding pure roots. And pure roots, as I said again, are the solutions to those, those symbols, as those uh, expressions. So in every step, you, you basically, you take roots and you nest them in a certain way. And whatever you can do that, you would call a polynomial, uh, polynomial equation like this one here, you would call it solvable. And this slide or this observation should kind of convince you or should be a good hint that what you should be looking for are cyclic extensions in the Galois group. So the Galois group should, should, should be kind of decomposable into cyclic pieces because each cyclic piece corresponds to a pure equation. That's basically the idea. There's a slight catch of heading the nth root of unity in the, in the ground field, which makes the proof a little bit Ugly if you send a vector after 
adjoin that one first, and then, then you get going with exactly the correspondence that I'm going to show you. But um, up to that, it's actually pretty nice. We will see. But anyway, um, I, maybe the whole point of this lecture on vector series on Galois theory is that Galois theory might, might be a little bit hard to define. So it takes you a while to get there, but it's just so much better than to work with polynomials explicitly. So here's an example, and it's a fairly big one. So let me just go through it very slowly. So this is the alternating group A4, and this is a subgroup lattice of the alternating group A4 in the same notation as before. So you have those bubbles here of conjugate subgroups. Um, here's another bubble of Z mod threes, and they are not normal because the bubble, so this is another bubble. So this is a trivial bubble, the Klein four group V4. And as long as the bubble only contains one element, you have a normal subgroup, right? So those two are not normal. This one is not normal. This one is not normal, but this one is. Anyway, and you see the degrees here, and I, I only bother to uh, add a number to one of those edges because it will be the same number anyway. As I said, they basically correspond to a point up to conjugation. Mm. Anyway, so um, under Galois correspondence, this picture corresponds to field extensions. So let's have a look at those field extensions, well, an example of those field extensions. As I said, Galois theory associates to many field extensions this picture. And that's kind of a trick because this picture contains exactly the necessary information um, about the polynomial and not complicated expressions that you will see below here that you kind of can ignore, but um, kind of also the point is, <laughs> I would like to compare this funny expression and, and later solutions to a certain polynomial equation to this picture, which is very just combinatorial in nature. Um, so to just write down the subgroup lattice of A4 might take you a while. A4 is a 12, uh, 24 element group, uh, 12 element group. S4 would be the 24 element group. Um, but, but still, it, it's not so hard. And of course, there is some nice computer system which has done that. And you can find the results in the link in the description in, on the group props page. So this is something you just look up. Very, very simple. You just look it up. In principle, you just look it up or you do it yourself, it's not so bad. Um, it's not so bad, anyway. Um, so what you can observe here is now that you have this normal subsequence, uh, which I write in this, so this was me, means normal subgroup, it's A4, that's where I start. I can't go to, the, to those guys here because they are not normal, this is a big bubble. So I go along this edge, I go to V4, and then I'm kind of good, although the Z mod, threes are not normal in A4 because they form this bubble. They are actually normal in, in, in uh, V4. So you can now take the next one, Z mod two. So they only have to be normal in each step. And then you're, then you also go, let's say you have to choose, let's say you go this one and then you go here. Okay, so you have this normal sequence in A4. And each of the successive quotients well, you can read off the, the order of the expected group here. So three, two, two, the successive quotients are Z mod three, Z mod two, and Z mod two. So they're all cyclic. And this should correspond to whenever you have a, a Galois extension, which has A4 as, as its Galois group um, by Galois correspondence, you should see the, exactly the same pattern. And you do. So um, in this case, I've chosen this element here, uh, this element and the last element, I will show you, show you in a second why, but let's for now just, just go with it. And you don't really see what's going on. Well, maybe you do. So in the, in the second step, I, I really just added the square root of the element, right? I can, I can subtract minus one, that's no problem. And I just added the square root. In the next step, if you stay on it a little bit, I also just added the square root of a new element. So let's start with this field. I basically want to add a square root of this element here, of this cosine. And I do this, but I just have whatever, two times, blah, blah, blah. And that's a new element I add. So I just took a square root of an element that I already had in my field. That was a pure extension. It was an extension of the form x squared minus a. I claim the last step is also a pure extension. Uh, and you can see this if you would use that this guy is already in your field, okay? 
So this one is also a pure extension. This one, on the other hand, is not a pure extension. So this cosine here is a solution to the equation x cubed minus 3x plus 1, I think. If I haven't messed up, uh, the link to the polynomial is in the description. So this is not pure. And the problem is you're missing a root of unity in your field. But basically, it's, 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 it's exactly this process. You add in every step corresponding to, um, to the jump you see. You add a certain element of, of your of a new field. And in each step, you should see a pure uh, extension. And the only thing you're off by here is that uh, you're missing a third root of unity. You would need to add that before, and then you would have the nice letters of pure extension, pure extension, pure extension, pure extension, coming from on the other side, um, cyclic, 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 cyclic. And that's, 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 a, that's exactly the picture that we will see here now. So the, the statement and the very surprising statement of Galois theory is that if you want to check whether a polynomial is solvable, then the only thing you need to do is you need to check that the Galois group is solvable. What does it mean for the Galois group to be solvable? Well, I just explained what it means uh, without, without defining it, but it's solvable if there exists a normal sequence such that su successive quotients are cyclic. And that's something you can, e for, for your favorite group, you can actually easily check it. I would feed it into a regime or look it up on group props, for example. So that's easy. Um, the corresponding root theoretical property isn't all that easy. I mean, look at those expressions, right? We'll come back to those expressions in a second. Um, and the, the, again, the power of Galois theory is that you transform a, a, a statement about polynomials into a combinatorial statement, which you can then solve by, well, group theory, by using a computer, by whatever. And the solvable part is basically, well, just formulating you want to add root of two, whatever I had before, minus something like that. And how do you do that? Well, you call a polynomial solvable if there exists a, a tower of field extensions. In each step, you add a pure root, right? In each step, you add a pure root. And in the end, you end up with a field that is big enough to contain at least the splitting field of F. And that just really means you can write down the solutions of your polynomial equations in terms of those guys um, and more complicated expressions. And one of the big upshots here, let me go back to this one here, is that the well here means in most cases you have absolutely no chance um, to do that. Let me actually try to convince you why by running magma. So here's magma. You should really test it out yourself. Link is in the description. It's online. Um, here's the kind of code you would use. And well, I, here's already the answer. I can submit again. Um, so this polynomial equation, which is just x to the to the fifth plus three times x minus uh, three times x cubed minus one, has Galois group of order 120 and this is a symmetric group of order 120. And that's one of the first examples of a non-solvable group. So if you think of solvable groups versus non-solvable groups, the solvable groups you should have in mind are everything you believe. So that's always solvable and groups that are very small. So the first non-solvable group is A5, so the alternating group of order 16. And uh, all symmetric groups from there onwards are not solvable. All alternating groups from there onwards are not solvable. Turns out that almost all um, polynomials you ever write down have symmetric group as their Galois group anyway. So you can't write them down. Never, no chance. You can't write them down. You don't have to think about it. You just can't. You just can't. It's a no go theorem. You just can't write down solutions in terms of radicals. Um, let me just vary the coefficients a little bit. Let me just throw in something like a minus 10. And I'm pretty sure it's still the same result. Uh, let me do this to a two. Uh, it's probably still the same result. So almost everything you ever write down will be, uh, will have the symmetric group, um, the corresponding symmetric group uh, as their Galois group. And to, to convince you that I'm not cheating, let me do a smaller example. Let me do this one, x to the third, and what are some other coefficient. And it tells me it's a symmetric group of order six. Well, maybe that was again, a little bit boring. So let me do, um, something easier, something. So the symmetric group of order six is of course solvable, but let me do this one, for example. And it's still the symmetric group. So let me do this one, for example. 
And this is a group of order two. So Z mod two as it should be because this is a third root of unity. Again, I highly encourage you to play around this magma. It's pretty impressive. You vary your coefficients. You almost always get this imagined group. Anyway, let me repeat. Galois theory gives you a machine to decide whether you can solve a polynomial equation or not. And I just showed you an example of a degree five equation, which is not solvable. If you believe me that the symmetric group S5 is not solvable, but it isn't, which automatically shows that you also can't write down a formula uh, to solve it. Because, well, if you would have a formula, then you could solve any equation, of course. So just having one counter example is enough to show that there is no general formula. That's a nicer argument to show that there is no general formula by uh, working um, over a field by adjoining formal coefficients. But anyway, just having one solution, uh, one non-solution is enough to disprove that there is a theorem, right? So it's, it's a counterexample to a potential theorem. Anyway, um, let me come back to this picture. And this is actually the splitting. So this is the picture for the splitting field of this funny polynomial, which I explained in a second how I got that. And this is solvable. And this is absolutely not obvious if you look at the roots. And it took me a while to get them. So Mathematica actually spits out a really ugly form of those roots. But you can get them. And remember that cosine itself, this cosine expression itself here, is actually also an iterated root. So this is certainly some kind of radical expression in, 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 in this form here, whatever. Uh, something like that, you know, some radical expression. Those how, how uh, this is this is how those roots usually look like. Really, really ugly. Really hard to get. Uh, in contrast, this picture is much preferable, at least in my opinion. And this is why I had those those expressions here. This is and it's really surprising. So I mean, look at this. I mean, there's no way I could ever guess this uh, solution from from just this equation. In this case, I could have just used the quintic, uh, the corresponding uh, formula of degree four, which is also very ugly. And uh, but anyway, um, uh, you maybe you find a polynomial of degree twelve, and I actually did find one using, <laughs> of course, this machinery. It's linked in the description. You can run Mathematica on it. You will see that that polynomial has um, Galois group, the alternating group A4. So you can actually solve it and can write down its 12 equations into, it's crazy, right? It's 12 equations in terms of those radicals. I haven't tried that. Uh, if you want, uh, good luck. It, it, it should be, well, it should be too hard, but it, it might be a little bit annoying. It's much easier to just ask Magma, um, what is the Galois group? Oh, Magma has a very nice call to do it. It basically looks at permutations of the coefficients. Um, and it spits out, oh, it's A4, so you know it's solvable and you don't bother anymore to write down these terrible, should, sorry, little equation, and, and so, sorry, little solution. I shouldn't call you terrible, but I think you look pretty ugly. Um, whatever, I'm, I'm starting waffling. So let me wrap up. Galois theory uh, takes you a long time to define, but as soon as you get it, it's a really powerful tool to study polynomial equations. Today I showed you, um, in this video, I showed you how to decide, really decide whether certain uh, polynomial equations are solvable in terms of radicals, so root ex expressions or not, by just looking at the corresponding Galois group. And that's a, a problem for a computer, basically. You can also do it by hand, but it's certainly a very easy problem for a computer. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.